It just went from good to not good. That's, that's what happens. That's, that's the problem with the book. Ho, 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 today's episode is brought to you by the Ridge Wallet. These things are awesome. They're light, sleek, industrial, doesn't fold their awkwardly bulge in your back pocket. It's designed to easily fit into your front pocket. It's gonna save your back. It's super, super tough, so it feels like it could take a bullet. So more ways than one, this thing could totally save your ass. It's like, why have we moved from flip phones to smartphones, but we still carry the same wallet? It's so cool, it's just a little bit bigger than your credit card. It's super easy to use, holds up to 12 cards, plus room for cash on the back. Really cool minimalist design. It would make a great stocking stuffer. It's a very, very easy gift. Easy on your wallet, haha. -ha. You're literally never going to need another wallet. It's the last one you'll need to buy. There's over 30 colors and styles, including carbon fiber and burnt titanium. And this new one they have that's uh, gold, it's crazy. This one is my go-to, the matte black titanium. Simple, classic, I love it. The durable material means that each wallet comes with a lifetime guarantee. You could buy this one wallet and carry it for life. Get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping and returns by going to ridge.com forward slash better than food and using the discount code better than food. The link is below. Thanks a bunch. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Get that coffee. Just a little bit of house cleaning really quick. I recently reviewed uh, Eroticism by Georges Bataille for DW Books for uh, Deutsche Welle. Uh, on their YouTube channel, so I'll link that below if you want to go and check that out. I'm particularly proud of that review, and I'm just very grateful for that opportunity because Deutsche Welle is great. You know, they're like the, the German BBC or something, if you haven't heard of them. They're huge, so that's really cool. Also, I'm now on Odyssey. It's this dope platform, this YouTube alternative, without all the advertising and censorship. You can donate crypto to creators on there. Full transparency, they invited me on there and they gave me a crypto donation for uploading my stuff, but they're not sponsoring this video. I'm telling you because I think they're a very cool alternative to YouTube and I'm excited to see where that goes. Anyways, I decided to put a link below. Also, if you wanna check out the link below for this shirt, it's pretty awesome. I got this from my uh, friend's clothing company, Doom Salad, that she started recently. I think it's great. So I'm sure a lot of you are experiencing this thing where every day is exactly the same, checking email, watching news, bad news. Businesses are dying, countries are falling apart, the infrastructures of cities are collapsing. Time for one of the worst holiday seasons in the history of the world. And all of this for a fake virus. I'm totally joking. <laughs> I sold that from a, from a guy in the line of the gym. I thought it, it was brilliant. Uh, and I never even saw his face. You gotta have some fun. It's the end of 2020. Uh, today is The Stand by Stephen King. I grew up reading Stephen King. You know, I read The Shining uh, when I was like 11, and It when I was 12 or 13 or something like that. That one's over a thousand pages. I thought these were great books at the time. It in particular is, is, is I, I still think it's, it's probably, a, a, probably a good book. His short stories were pretty frightening to me as well when I was that age. The Man in Black was a good ghost story, really, really creepy. And you know, The Man in Black actually has uh, uh, similarities to the antagonist uh, in this one. Maybe there are some through lines through the writing of Stephen King. Um, it seems like it, at least. I must have started the stand um, once or twice, maybe more. This is the extended version clocking in at 1,439 pages. Yeah, the regular version I think is like 1,200 something, I think. So basically you're in it for the long haul no matter what. Uh, it, it's a hell of a commitment. Not that he really needs an introduction, but Stephen King is an American horror, adventure, and fantasy author who's uh, influenced by people like H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, Ray Bradbury, Elmore Leonard. He must be one of the most financially successful fiction authors in, in history. And he's a household name, I think, I think in more places in America. Of course, it's Stephen King, man. I don't think you could name a more famous author in the States, at least. His most famous titles would probably be, um, you know, It, The Shining, uh, The Gunslinger, maybe, and this one, The Stand, which was adapted into a TV miniseries in the 90s. And then again, apparently, released the other day with uh, Whoopi Goldberg and Alexander Skarsgård. However, though they've remade it, nothing is going to uh, top the montage of corpses all across America, strewn all over the place, uh, to the tune to, to crowded houses don't dream it's over. That'll stick with you as a kid. And sure enough, as I was driving up here moving to Portland, Oregon at the beginning of the pandemic, when everything started locking down, through the territory where this book takes place, by the way, I discovered, that's what was going through my head, that song, that song just going through. As, a, as the numbers were going up, as COVID numbers were climbing, I just had uh, 
Don't Dream It's Over stuck in my head and I just pictured all of those uh, dead bodies everywhere. And I looked up the YouTube clip. It's not quite as striking as I remember. I think it's always more vivid when you're a kid and it's, it has kind of an impact. But I never could hear that song again anywhere and not think of that uh, scene. You know, that really sticks with you. So The Stand. Okay, first, The Good. Here's the setup. The Stand is about a strain of flu, uh, a bioweapon, that's accidentally released from a government compound in the desert. Upon an unsuspecting population, during the year 1990 in the extended version, I believe, but uh, the original was published in 1978. This has kind of got some updates and stuff. It's released upon the public by a soldier who is infected and escapes the compound before it can, you know, uh, go into lockdown, before, before the, the gates shut, basically, and everything locks and uh, all the people inside just die, which plenty do, but uh, he escapes. This uh, soldier living on this base with his family, his wife and, uh, and, and child, and uh, they get in a car and they split. So he eventually gets sick, you know, and she gets sick, his wife and his, his, their, their kid gets sick, and they, uh, they eventually make it to Texas, and uh, they crash into this gas station, these gas station pumps. They, they die right there, you know, the, the, the wife and child are already dead, and he's like rotting away and hacking and just barely alive, and then he dies too, of course. And uh, the guys who find him at this gas station, you know, they, uh, they get sick as well, and then it just spreads from there. And, and maybe the most entertaining part of the book, actually, is just uh, um, reading where the virus spreads and how it spreads and who it spreads to. The, the beginning is really magnificent, I gotta say. And, of course, extremely disturbing in a way because of what we've all been dealing with for the last year. This super flu, known colloquially as Captain Trips, is like an accelerated normal flu with a shifting antigen, like AIDS as the book explains. So every time your body changes to fight it, it changes too, and your body can't keep up. And then eventually you get all discolored and swollen and die. So it spreads everywhere. It's unbelievably contagious. It spreads all across America, all across the world, for all we know. So in a span of a couple weeks, it's estimated that 99.4% of the entire population is killed by this thing, by Captain Trips. It also takes out horses and dogs. It leaves cats. Of course, along with all these sudden deaths comes a, a, a panicked government, and the, so there's just a tsunami of political corruption and assassinations and just uh, martial law and protests that turn violent. Lockdowns, tension, protests, fear, murder, racially motivated violence. All the things that we're literally experiencing right now in this very moment, but exaggerated. But, you know, it's not that far away. It's really not. That's the reason to read the book, the main one, in my opinion, is just how close uh, reality has gotten to uh, a Stephen King novel. It's actually pretty, um, it's pretty weird. The book starts off great. It starts off with a hell of a bang. It's fast paced, it's compelling, it's a great idea, it's a great concept, excellent concept. So yeah, people everywhere are literally falling where they stand. And basically, America dies. The whole thing. Except not quite. There's a very, 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 very small number of people who are immune for whatever reason. We never find out and neither do they. They're left alive in this uh, new hideous landscape scattered all across the nation and the book tells their story. There's also one other character who is not human at all. He looks like one, but is actually a servant of hell. Not Satan, but an associate, like a lower demon, a soldier or a general of hell. Beelzebub, maybe. And he's getting things ready to wipe out the small remainder of humans. He's building an army to serve the Antichrist. And where would you suspect that he's building such an army? Bright light city, gonna set my soul, gonna set my soul on fire. Viva Las Vegas, Nevada, baby. So he's attracting people in their dreams, right? They're dreaming of this dark man and they're coming to the West and to Vegas and uh, he's building this army. And meanwhile, there's this other woman, this old 108 year old woman in Nebraska in this cornfield uh, named Mother Abigail. And uh, people are dreaming about her and they feel the exact opposite that they feel when they dream about the bad man, the dark man. Randall Flagg, whatever. She's about as much of a character as the Dark Man is. They're both uh, symbols. They're not even really characters. Good guys, bad guys, dreams, people from all over traveling to one or the other. You see what happened there? It just went from good to not good. That's, that's what happens. That's, that's the problem with the book. It starts off great. It, it, it starts off with like an almost like titanic, unsinkable premise. This is where everything really seems to take a turn for the worse. The realist horror, exaggerated, but you know, still, realist horror, 
devolves into fantastical pap. God and Satan very much exist in this story. It's, it's an allegory, but it's even more heavy-handed than that. It's just a Christian story, really. I'd call it an allegory because, you know, you could kind of interpret it, but it's really not, like, it doesn't, there's, there's no subtlety at all. It's really directly stated. There's nothing wrong with that per se, it just means that deus ex machina is more of a literary device than I care for. A lot more, if you get my drift. But not scary. Even though everybody seems to be pissing themselves all the time, let's talk about that. King is a real fixation on everyone, animals included, uh, pissing themselves all the time. Watch for it, you'll see. And not in this story only. In fact, you can count the times that Stephen King is mentioning piss in his books, and uh, you'll be shocked. There's actually a Reddit thread on this I discovered. I'm just having a crack, I'm just joking. But I mean, you know, I like Stephen King, I do. He had more of an impact on me in my early years than probably any other author. I should have read this book then, not now. There's a lot more that could have been done in far fewer pages. The Stand is a far less intellectually compelling version of Twin Peaks without the amazing music and the horror. And then by the end, it turns into a mixture of Lord of the Rings and the Toxic Avenger at the MGM Grand in Vegas. I'm not actually joking. It's a wandering group of goofy, almost parodically American characters in a soap opera web of predictable patterns of human behavior, love, hate, jealousy, war. Sure, these are the things we have to work with, right. I know, there's, there's only so many stories in the world. But this book is cliche to the point where, in his defeat, because of course, spoiler, the dark man is literally saying, no, because good always triumphs over evil. Of course, crime doesn't pay. Uh, what can I say? The characters are not strong. They are cardboard cutouts. So there's Fran, uh, a young woman from Maine, whose pre-plague pregnancy is essentially the clock which the narrative is set by. There's Stu Redman, an East Texan, who was at that gas station where the guy crashed. And then he's taken to this plague center where he's experimented on by, you know, the evil government against his will, and he escapes after they try and kill him. There's Larry Underwood, who's a kind of a pop singer from, from New York, and Tom Cullen, a mentally challenged but very affable, cheerful grown man who has kind of a psychic gift. On the opposing side, there's a guy who's referred to as Trash Can Man, a pyromaniac who has these kind of a special abilities to uh, sniff out uh, very heavy duty weapons, kind of obsessed with anything related to fire. Uh, there's Harold Lauder, who was a friend of Franny's back in Maine, uh, who is in love with her and then, you know, is kind of on the fence and then just goes bad. Uh, there's Nadine, who is, uh, sort of the bride-to-be of the dark man. Uh, she's a virgin, she's saving herself for him. And then there's Lloyd Henry, who's sort of a small-time crook, who's saved from starvation in prison by the dark man himself, Randall Flagg, as he goes by. Uh, let's talk about him, let's talk about Randall Flagg. He's like Bob in Twin Peaks, the kind of shape-shifting man who appears in visions to people, clad in a Canadian tuxedo with long hair and cowboy boots. They call him the dark man, or Randall Flagg, or Alexander Skarsgård. He's the bad guy. Let's see what Tom Cullen has to say about him when he goes into one of his psychic trances. What does he look like, Tom? Tom didn't speak for a long time. Stu had decided he wasn't going to answer and he was preparing to go back to the script when Tom said, he looks like anybody you see on the street. But when he grins, birds fall dead off telephone lines. When he looks at you a certain way, your prostate goes bad and your urine burns. There it is. The grass yellows up and dies where he spits. He's always outside. He came out of time. He doesn't know himself. He has the name of a thousand demons. Jesus knocked him into a herd of pigs once. His name is Legion. He's afraid of us. We are inside. He knows magic. He can call the wolves and live in the crows. He's the king of nowhere, but he's afraid of us. He's afraid of inside. He's a constantly grinning guy who just gives small animals like embolisms when they look at him. He controls weasels and wolves and can kind of shape shift and throw his third eye anywhere he wants to spy. Makes people feel cold. Thing is, Flag doesn't actually do a lot to kind of uh, come off as this all-powerful evil demon guy for like the first thousand pages of the book, other than make people like piss themselves whenever he's nearby and dramatically walk on boot heels uh, on the highway. Um, he's not particularly frightening at all. I mean, Franny has dreams about him grinning at her with a coat hanger, and that's about the worst thing he does for the majority of the book, honestly. He doesn't really strike fear in the heart of the reader. At least not this one. Not like McCarthy's Judge from Blood Meridian. He orders some people crucified in Las Vegas uh, in kind of a weird move, one for drug use. It's kind of inconsistent with this character, to be honest. You'd think everybody in like the, in, the, in the totalitarian Vegas would be like high on meth or something, like the Nazis and just like, you know. But apparently that's a sin for the fellow in the camp of Vegas. Um, 
go figure. He's not a very puritanical type guy, which is sort of weird and inconsistent. He apparently went to school with Charles Starkweather. I thought that was an interesting line from the book. The most interesting the book gets, for me, is the sex scene with Nadine. Because what King tries to conjure is the feeling of a woman who has journeyed through hell and back to get to this man, to be with him, and then discovers that it's the absolutely worst idea imaginable. And what King is doing is describing what it feels like to get fucked by a demon. Tearing this woman's mind and body apart, you know, and planting this seed that is going to be the new Antichrist. It reminded me of Rosemary's Baby a little bit. But, you know, how do you write a scene like that? That's a very interesting question because that's, that's a tough order to fill, right? So I've, I thought that King's, I mean, it wasn't perfect, but I mean, it was, it was, it was the most interesting attempt at describing something really horrifying in the whole book, in my opinion, in, in the fantastical portion. Of course, of course, the realist horror in the beginning was excellent with the, with the, the setup, with the plague and all this stuff and all these people dying and how it spreads and all that, that's great. Uh, but, but as far as like the fantastical stuff, I thought it's all really quite bad, except when he really went there with this one, it was really like going out there like, ooh, like that's, it was, it was genuinely disturbing. But that was the most interesting the actual writing got in kind of a form way. It was an interesting attempt. But sadly, after that little uh, excursion, you know, in, in the stand, uh, it's, it's really back to just kind of the same old. So what did I dislike about the book? Um, well, obviously, like by this point, you know, everything, the vast majority of it. I think I went in with the wrong expectations, right? Cause, cause context is important. I know, I know. I mean, I'm talking a little bit of shit and you know, Steve, if you're watching this, I'm sorry, I like you. I, th I thought there was going to be more of a component of it that was an actual attempt at real literature, like serious literature, as opposed to just entertainment. I really thought it was going to be uh, deeper because that beginning uh, is, the premise is excellent. Again, uh, I was wrong. So if you're looking for just entertainment, I mean, that's perfectly fine, more power to you. But for me, no. There's something quintessentially American about The Stand in the worst way. This is a book that will be loved by people who seriously use the word heartwarming, which is a term that whenever I hear people use it, makes me literally want to yank my own dick off and beat them to death with it. Anyways, Bob from Twin Peaks is legit scary from the get-go. Randall Flagg, eh. Is it better than food? No, fuck no. The book is overwritten and overexplained. Kitchen sink, supernatural devices, deus ex machina, a couple of power reversals, neither clever nor surprising. There's some tearful goodbyes and reunions and a dog that saves the day. Cue the water sports, I mean waterworks. The good guys win, the bad guys lose, the people on the fence gone bad are dealt justice. It's the story of the war between good and evil post super flu pandemic. Each side makes their stand. Everything is so explained and King's opinions are far too pervasive to let the reader make up his or her mind about whether or not the actions taking place in the book are good, bad, right, wrong, or anything in between. He's going to make quite sure you're on this person's side. And he's going to have the hand of God literally reach out to pull off some shit for them. Just in case there was any question about who's good and who's bad. That's some fascist writing right there. Stephen King writes something and then tells you how to feel about it. He's telling you to piss your pants instead of letting you piss your pants on your own because it's so scary, which is ideally what would happen. I'd love to piss my pants because I'm so scared of a book. I, I'd have a field day. My God, it, it would be my favorite book in the whole world. I'd love it. King also has this habit God, where he gives away major plot points in the last line of the paragraph. And that was the last time he ever saw them again. And that was the last time they ever pissed their pants. I think this is because it's satisfying for the writer, but it literally destroys the wonder for the reader. But if you need shit spelled out for you, he's your man. M-O-O-N, that spells piss. You know, it's kind of like the authoritative voice, the biblical tale telling voice. And he did X, Y, and Z. And he did, and it was so, and blah, 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 blah. I mean, what do I know? I mean, he wrote this when he was in his 20s, younger than me, and he's doing fine. He's, he's a fucking billionaire or whatever. The cringe factor is heavy in this one. This is coming from the guy wearing this hat. You know, Stephen King has just got this very strange Americanic weirdness. You could say it's, it's very unique, it is. His style is very unique. His employment of songs and phrases and, and weird, strange sayings and rhymes and, and goofy sayings and goofy quotes, and it's, it's bizarre. So the question in my mind is, are we going to see Ezra Miller sodomized with the end of a revolver by a guy who looks like a pistol-wielding Elvis who says he'd piss Coors if he could because he loves it so much? 
My money has it that didn't make it in. But please, if it did, somebody let me know. Again, the piss factor. I know, I know it's gross. I didn't write it. Never since Story of the Eye have I read so much about piss. And even then, it makes Story of the Eye look positively conservative. Promising start, again. But at the end of the day, it's just entertainment. It's not challenging, which is fine, but I like to be challenged. I assume you do too. In my opinion, it's an excellent premise with poor execution. Nothing against Stephen King. He's a fine writer. He's better and more successful than I'll ever be, I'm sure. I had the wrong expectations. Whatever. The stuff that was closer to real life when the, when the pandemic is really getting going or right after people die, that was, that was much scarier. Real life is much more frightening than the, than, the, than the fantasy shit. The scariest part of the book was the reaction of people to the pandemic and the resulting events that followed before all the supernatural stuff. One could never say that Mr. King isn't outrageously successful at what he does. From what I hear, he's also a ridiculously hard worker. So I mean no ill will. While I do appreciate the master of horror, that in some cases he absolutely seems to be, it's just not my cup of tea. And it's my own fault for getting the extended edition. But even with the normal one clocking in at over 1200 pages, this is just too damn long. So better than food? No. But if you like Stephen King, you'll probably love it. Not that you asked me, but if you came to me and said, hey, should I read this? I'd say no. You should go and read Blood Meridian instead. Coffee time. For those of you who are new, I take all the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video. I place their names in this mason jar and I pull out for every review I do and I send whoever's name I pull out a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing plus a bag of coffee roasted normally by yours truly and I might get back to it soon. But lately, because of the pandemic and to support small businesses, roasted by one of the awesome roasters here in Portland, Oregon. And the coffee is delicious, trust me. If you would like to help support the show, you can go to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food and donate $5 or more per video or follow the link below. I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Truly. All of you who have helped support the show have made this year so much more bearable than, than uh, unfortunately it is, I think, for a lot of people out there right now. And it's very, very tragic. And on a serious note, it's actually deeply, deeply upsetting and very sad to see. I hope you're all doing okay. Really because I think there's a lot of folks out there who are not. Thank you so much for helping make this a possibility, sincerely. If you donate $1 or more, you'll get access to the patron-only reviews, the Discord channel, which is awesome. If you think, I mean, if you like the stuff that I'm talking about, the Discord channel is just recommending uh, all kinds of stuff all the time, music, films, books. I mean, it's just rad. And uh, you'll also get uh, uh, access to the uh, Better Than Friday newsletter, which I send out every Friday, which is just a list of uh, five different things that I'm interested in at any given time, you know, books in the pipeline, music, films, changes week to week. Thank you so much to all the patrons. Happy holidays and best of luck. Okay, here we go. Ha ah. Rogelio S. Rogelio, thank you very much. I truly appreciate it. You're going to receive The Stand by Stephen King, plus some delicious coffee. You're also going to receive this awesome t-shirt from Doom Salad. And you're also going to receive this Better Than Food mug. All right, that's all I've got for you today. Thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourselves. Happy holidays. And uh, always remember, even if you're reading The Stand. I mean, go ahead, read The Stand. Who cares? I mean, we're never gonna live through this pandemic thing again. Uh, you know, who knows? I mean, like, you, you wanna do it? Go for it. Go for it. You do it. You do you. Whatever. Pee your pants. But uh, always remember to bring a book, no matter what it is, where, wherever you go. I mean, if, it, if it's the difference between watching TV and reading a book, then read this, please, for the love of God. Read, just read. Much more coming, hopefully in a more timely manner now that this is over. All right, take care of yourselves. Have a great night. Talk to you soon. Ciao.